I'm your de facto tech expert for the day. And that's not a great position to put yourself in, especially when you're not uh, used to do doing these hybrid meetings. So I appreciate your patience with us today. Most everything has been working out well, pretty well. So hopefully I can make it work for myself to bring home this, this last presentation. I'm Tim Raditz. Uh, I work for the Discovery Farms programs in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Today, I'm gonna be talking about our Discovery Farms program and a little bit of, or, and focusing on our tile drainage data set. I, I love talking about tile drainage because I was trained as an ag engineer and I was told going to school for that, for ag engineering that uh, tile drainage was really the only things ag engineers ever figured out. So I'm here to, to hold the flag for eng ag engineers today. So just to start it off, in case you haven't heard of Discovery Farms, uh, Discovery Farms is a water-led or a farmer-led water quality research and educational program. We focus on three aspects, uh, one being farmer leadership, two being credible research, and three being communicating the results. Um, so we're modeled after uh, the Wisconsin Discovery Farms program, which started around 2000. We started here in Minnesota in about 2010, and currently there are uh, Discovery Farms programs in Vermont and Arkansas as well. A key to our program is collecting data, uh, either surface water runoff or tile drainage and we collect year round. So we set up uh, automated monitoring equipment uh, that works every day out of the year, 365 days a year. And we're looking at different weather conditions, whether it be precipitation, soil moisture, soil temperature. Um, uh, we're measuring the amount of flow that either moves over the soil surface and off the field or comes through the, the uh, tile leaving the field. We're sampling that water for uh, different uh, water quality constituents, focusing on sediment and nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, we look at three different forms of nitrogen and two different forms of phosphorus. And the most important thing that we try to do is with our monitoring, with the flow volume and the concentration, we can then look at not just concentration data, but we can look at losses on a pounds per acre basis. So our programs are, are really built on partnerships. That's the key to our program. Farmers are specifically key to our, our program. Participants really give us insight into how things are working on their land, different climatic conditions that are happening. We also are led by a steering committee, which is comprised of uh, farmers across the state. And they really help us select projects, determine where we need to do work and uh, keep us moving in the right direction. We also partner with the Department of Agriculture. They're our monitoring partner. They're really the experts in collecting this edge of field water quality data in the state of Minnesota. And they do a great job at providing us a high quality and unbiased data set that we can then use in education and outreach programs. And also we partner with local um, uh, partners, either local SWCDs or watershed districts. These are the people actually out there doing the work. I see some of our friends from Stearns County are here today. Um, they're essential in terms of going out and maintaining our monitoring sites, collecting these water samples and shipping them off to the lab for analysis. And as we get into February and March here, um, this gets to be quite a difficult task as snow melt runoff is such a big portion of our, our hydraulic uh, information in Minnesota and Wisconsin, that actual upkeep of the monitoring stations during that freezing and thaw period is really difficult and really time intensive. So what are we talking about today? Tile drainage, T tile drainage, we've heard about uh, this a lot today throughout the day. So I'll just quickly move through this. Uh, it has many potential benefits. Essentially, we're lowering the water table, getting uh, better root growth, better plant growth, allowing for more timeliness of field operations and trafficability, and reducing surface runoff and erosion by lowering that water table, allowing more rainfall to infiltrate the soil surface and, and move through the soil instead of off the uh, soil surface. I think another really important uh, strong, part, strong point of tile is the ability to, to be successful with 
conservation practices, whether it be reduced tillage, no tillage, looking at cover crops. I think you need to get your water managed first with tile drainage before we move into some of these other um, conservation practices to have more success with them as, as we try to see what works. Drainage also has some potential uh, challenges, primarily due to nitrate movement. Um, that's a, a large water quality concern. So that's specifically what we're gonna look at with our, our tile drainage data set. When we're looking at our data set, I'm gonna be talking about two different um, sources of data across Minnesota and Wisconsin. One being our primary automated, uh, uh, automated sampling equipment. Um, we've collected this data from 2005 through current. We've been on 20 sites at 15 different farms, have 119 site years of that data looking. It's, it's really intensive, automated, uh, uh, flow-based monitoring uh, equipment. The second data set I'm gonna talk about is our Tile CIG uh, project. And this was completed in, in 2018 to 2020. And this one, we, we, we looked at some lesser forms of monitoring. It would be uh, related around grab sampling. And the idea behind this was to get more data on more farmer's fields um, and not spending such a high price tag to get that, that information. So first I'm gonna start out with soil and phosphorus. I'm sorry, Fabian, I know this is a nitrogen conference, but we are gonna talk a little soil and phosphorus. But if we're talking about soil and phosphorus, and we're looking at the differences between surface runoff and tile flow, and this is across our entire data set across Minnesota and Wisconsin, looking at annual soil loss on the y-axis, and each of these dots is a site year. So you can see, most of our soil loss moves through surface runoff. And correspondingly, most of our uh, phosphorus movement moves through surface runoff as well. Although there are some higher sites and I'll talk a little bit about why that is in the coming slides. Although we didn't see much soil loss with tile systems, we did see some differences between our tile sites on different farms. And we can relate this specifically to the type of tile installations that are occurring at these sites. On the left here is all corrugated uh, plastic tile, a newer uh, technology for tile systems, um, a little bit different the way the water moves into that tile. And on the right here is all an older, um, either deteriorating plastic or cement or clay tile system. And you can see in those, we have some higher sediment concentrations, likely due to the way that the water moves into these tiles in those older systems. And also some of these systems had blowouts, some areas of, of tile failure, which provided direct access, uh, a direct conduit to the tile. Soil test phosphorus, if we're looking at our, our higher um, phosphorus levels in, in some of our tile systems, it, it is strongly related to soil test phosphorus in that top inch of soil. So as our soil test phosphorus increased, so did our, our dissolved phosphorus concentration in that tile water. So if we can manage our, our, our soil test phosphorus and keep it in, in some accept, acceptable levels, we can really reduce the amount of phosphorus that moves through our tile systems. Nitrogen loss, this is where I'm mainly gonna to focus today. Um, the story flips with this um, constituent where we're more focused on tile flow. Uh, we're gonna see most of our nitrogen movement through tile, subsurface tile systems compared to surface water runoff. And this makes sense as uh, about over 90% of our nitrate or nitrogen in our tile flow is in the nitrate form and nitrate moves freely with water. So as it's converted to nitrate in our soil profile and water moves through that soil profile, it can bring nitrate along with it. Now, if we're looking across our data set, the amount of nitrogen loss in tile systems is heavily dependent on the amount of tile flow. We have a, a really strong uh, positive 
relationship between annual tile flow here on the X axis and annual nitrate loss on the Y axis. And it, it's, it seems to relate to about four pounds of nitrate loss per inch of, of tile drainage. And what is some, sometimes frustrating as land managers or farmers is we don't have a whole lot of control on the amount of tile flow that we're gonna have in any particular year because it's heavily dependent on the amount of precipitation you get from year to year, your timeliness of precipitation. We just live in an area where we're gonna have excess water and our tile systems are gonna move that water at some, some point throughout the year. However, you can see in, in the color of these dots and the size of these dots represents the concentration of nitrate in those uh, site years. And you can see there's, there's smaller dots on the bottom side of this relationship and larger uh, dots and darker dots on the, on the higher side of this relationship. So nitrate concentration does have an impact. And, and these, that is something that we as land managers or farmers can impact with our, our for our practices, our cropping systems, uh, decisions that we make out on the landscape. This is just an example of how nitrate concentrations in the soil profile can in influence loss. This chart represents that same um, data set I was talking about. And those different color bars are, are concentrations of nitrate. And so at six inches of drainage, uh, losses can be tripled just by an increase in concentration. So what you do on the land, how you manage your nitrogen, uh, how you manage your cropping systems does matter and can have an impact on the amount of nitrogen we're losing or we're moving through the tile system. As an example to this, uh, I'll talk about some 4R practices specifically uh, timing of nitrogen application and rate of nitrogen application. This is a case study from one of our Minnesota Discovery Farm sites. We're looking at six years of data here uh, from 2011 through 2016. And the first three years were in corn. Uh, 2014 was transitioned to alfalfa. However, the, the site was washed out by a historic uh, storm event. I think it was more than a 500 year storm. Um, so that year we considered fallow. There wasn't anything growing at that point. And then into 2015, uh, alfalfa was established and, and growing. And then finally into 2016. And what we're plotting here are tile uh, nitrate sample concentrations. So for 2011 and 2012, uh, there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of tile nitrate levels. And both of these years had spring manure application for the corn crop. So pretty close to when that crop was gonna utilize that nitrogen in the manure. Um, and we didn't see a, a large increase in tile nitrate concentrations. 2013, we had a bit of a, a change. We had a fall manure application for that corn crop. And this was a little bit further from when uh, from one application to when the, the corresponding corn crop was gonna use that nitrogen. So we did see a little bit higher uh, nitrate levels in the following sp spring in the tile lines, but also there was an additional fertilizer application that really kicked the rates up even higher. And we saw a corresponding uh, increase in concentrate tile nitrate concentrations um, during that year. Oh. As we move on into the fallow season, it didn't really change much. There is some data in the lower uh, areas here. Those were some really small, uh, low uh, tile flow samples. But if we look at the majority of the year, really the concentration stayed in that same range. But as we got into 2015 and 2016, you can see the, the benefit of alfalfa. Um, when we're looking at nitrate movement in tiles. It just was a steady downward march as that alfalfa grew, the roots started to take up that nitrate. And uh, in 2016, when the alfalfa was fully established, uh, our, our nitrate samples were much less um, than our corn years. So really a benefit of that, that dairy forage rotation system 
is that alfalfa being part of that those corn years to help manage some of those nitrate uh, losses. So when we talk to our farmers, uh, we usually talk to them about um, managing nitrate concentrations because we don't have a whole lot of impact on the amount of flow that we're gonna get out of our tile system. We really want to look at tile nitrate concentrations and this can really give us an indication of how our, our nitrogen management is doing out there in, in the real world. So this is an interesting chart I show a lot from uh, uh, Purdue looking at how to interpret nitrate concentrations. And if we're in cor or, uh, corn so soybean production and we're applying nitrogen at the optimum rate and optimum times, we're typically gonna see concentrations in that 10 to 20 parts per million or uh, milligrams per liter range. So that is what um, we talk to our farmers about is if we can get in this range, uh, we're doing, uh, fairly well with our nitrogen management. The, the point at where we look to make changes in nitrogen management is when our uh, concentrations get above that 20 parts per million or milligrams per liter. So those are areas we, when we do get samples back that are, are elevated, we look to see why is that. And it, it typically relates to either uh, nitrogen rate was a little high, the timing was not well synchronized. We had something environmentally going on, um, which led to the higher tile nitrate concentrations. So this last part of the, the presentation, I'm gonna talk about our, our CIG project, where we uh, looked at um, different tile monitoring methods um, to obtain data on more sites throughout the state. And this was a joint project with Wisconsin as well. And our, our goal was to provide tools for farmers and advisors to diagnose and treat fields with high nutrient loss through tile drains. And we wanted to surround our intensively monitored tile sites. So our really um, high cost Cadillac monitoring systems, we surrounded with lesser cost, lower intensity, uh, monitoring sites to give us some sort of comparison on these different levels of monitoring. And lastly, we also did a lot of soil health sampling to try to understand the link between soil health and tile drainage. So there were three monitoring styles. Um, our intensive sites, we had eight of those, one in each of our four areas in Minnesota and one in each of our four areas in Wisconsin. And these were our standard um, Discovery Farms monitoring stations with automated equipment. So we're doing constant flow monitoring, constant water sampling, taking flow-based samples. But we also bi-weekly grab sampled these sites to compare our, our, our bi-weekly samples to our really high quality numbers. We had 20 intermediate sites where we did constant flow monitoring and bi-weekly water sampling. And then basic sites where we're doing bi-weekly flow sampling and bi-weekly uh, water sampling as well. So if we focus on nitrate, um, which is what we're sort of here to talk about today, um, we have a, a bunch of data on a bunch of sites through this project. So we just pulled out some different factors of different aspects of management where we saw some differences in the tile um, or nitrate, the tile nitrate values. And the first being crop type. Um, if you sort these sites by crop type, we saw differences in nitrate levels between the corn and soybean fields, then moving down as we get into dry bean and wheat and further down a little bit more as we get into alfalfa as well. We did have one pasture site in Wisconsin and the nitrate levels were uh, fairly low on that site as well. But that doesn't tell the whole story, right? There's still a lot of scatter in this data set. Um, each of those points is a, is a site year and there can be anywhere from zero to above 40. So just crop type alone is not gonna tell the whole story. If we add in crop type and then group by previous crop, we can break it down even further. These are nitrate values for cornfields 
grouped by previous crops. So continuous corn on the left here, followed by corn soybean, uh, corn following wheat, and then corn following alfalfa, we see a declining uh, nitrate concentration in those tiles. If we look at rate, we can also see some differences uh, for groupings. Um, this is looking at nitrate, nitrate values for corn fields um, in the tile, grouped by nitrogen rate. And we can see that we're, we're plotting up average annual nitrate concentrations. And as our rates increased, so did our, our nitrate levels in our tiles. As we got to really high levels, we really didn't have that many site years. Uh, so it's really hard to, to say if uh, we're getting a, a full picture there. Uh, but there was some increase as we got up to 200 pounds of, of nitrogen per acre in our, our nitrate movement in our tile systems. This uh, we looked at, we had some cover crop data and, and this will follow up nicely on what Jeff uh, talked about earlier. Um, he has a lot of data on the, on the plot scale, looking at the impact of cover crops on nitrogen movement and the potential uh, to reduce that nitrogen movement. We did see this out in the field. Uh, this top uh, line of graphs is no cover crop for cornfields and the bottom is a cover crop. So we didn't have a whole lot of cover crop data, but, um, and I, I should say on the x-axis here are nitrogen rates for that uh, corn crop. But so for the 50 pounds per acre and the 100 pounds per acre nitrogen rates, we did see a decrease in the amount of uh, nitrate movement in, or nitrate concentrations in those tile lines. Finally, if we look and break this down even further, looking at uh, corn grouped by previous crop and nitrogen rate, we can really uh, start to break this down and, and tease out the data further. Corn following corn, we see a pretty nice relationship as uh, the uh, nitrogen rates increase. Corn following soybean, a similar level of increase, maybe not quite as high, but there is an increase as we, as we move up in nitrogen rate. And finally, corn following alfalfa, we did see some increase, um, but the increase really wasn't as great as uh, corn following corn and corn following soybean. So as we move in to talk about soil health and tile drainage, um, soil health practices have the potential to improve water quality by increasing infiltration and water holding capacity and protecting soil from erosion. This is a, an extreme, can be an extremely positive thing for surface runoff, but our question is, how is this gonna impact tile drainage? If we're uh, promoting more infiltration um, and changing the way nutrients are cycling within our soil profile, is that going to be a positive uh, water quality benefit for tile, or is that going to create some challenges? Uh, so we have questions regarding to that, and we measured a bunch of different uh, soil health metrics, including active carbon, particulate organic matter, matter, PMN, PMC, total organic carbon, the Haney extraction, and uh, respiration. And we also took some physical measurements along with that. Our biggest challenge with this when we started in 2017 or 2018 were quests, questions on methodology. And I think there's still some question as to how these soil health samples are collected. You know, when do you collect them? Um, we had lots of questions with our group as to when is the best time to collect these samples. We decided on June because it's typically when you're, you're soil biology is most active um, and hopefully we're going to see the biggest differences during that time is what we thought. Also location, you know, with our tile sampling, we're monitoring everything at an outlet of a watershed anywhere from five to a hundred acres. So how do you take soil samples in correspondence with that to have, you know, one set of soil data and one set of water data? That was a challenge for us. Depth of sample, there was really no standard depth of sample uh, for soil health when we started taking these measurements. And then sample transport was also an issue. At the end of the day, uh, this project did not find any correlations between soil health measurements and tile water quality, and which is uh, not what we were hoping for, but there's possible reasons why. 
one, our method, methodology wasn't sufficient. Uh, either we sampled at the wrong time, did not take enough samples, needed to take multiple samples throughout the year. Something with our methodology wasn't right. Also our sediment and phosphorus concentrations were low in our tile sites. So uh, it's hard to determine differences when you're having, uh, uh, when you have low concentrations. And then likely we also didn't have enough sites in our, our data set. There's just too many variables when it comes to soil health that we just didn't have enough uh, sites to really tease out the impacts of soil health on tile water quality. And I think this is what we see a lot. We, we can tease out some of the agronomic practices when it comes to tile water quality. And I think soil health can have some impact too, but it, it's, it's at a much, it's a more of a subtle impact that we weren't able to pull out with this study design. And this is, I think, one of the more important things to come out of this study, um, looking at how accurate our tile biweekly samples versus if we're sampling 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, and so this is where we, we have our, our Cadillac monitoring systems and that are sampling all the time, but we also go out and just pull water every two weeks from these sites and compare flow-weighted mean concentrations on the y-axis versus bi-weekly averages on the x-axis. These flow-weighted mean concentrations would be from our, our, our high-quality data set um, and considered very accurate. So you can see for sediment in this graph in the upper left, we're really, with our bi-weekly sampling, we're really underestimating the amount of, of sediment um, in the tile water. And similar for phosphorus and dissolved phosphorus, we're just not, or we're underestimating with biweekly samples, uh, those two um, constituents as well. What's really cool is, is uh, nitrate. And this is typically what we're most concerned with with tile is anyway, uh, but our nitrate values um, for our biweekly averages and our flow weighted mean concentrations were really close to that one-to-one -one line had a very tight relationship, meaning that we can get really good results from our biweekly sampling. If you're interested in knowing your nitrate levels coming off your field, taking biweekly samples when your tiles are flowing, you're gonna get really good information that you can, you can learn from. So that's really, uh, I, I think really imp an important part of this study. So just to wrap it up, uh, keys to reduce soil and nutrient losses through tile systems. Uh, Firstly, for soil update and maintain those tile systems. It prevents those blowouts. It, it, if we can put some newer uh, pipes in, it can really reduce the amount of soil that's moving through the tile systems. Also man, uh, manage your soil test phosphorus levels to reduce that uh, tile dissolved phosphorus. And for nitrogen, really evaluate our four R's. So our timing, our rates of nitrogen application and cropping rotations to reduce that risk. And if you're interested in learning about the nitrogen levels from your fields, bi-weekly samples, uh, just looking at nitrate can really provide a high quality uh, data source that you can rely on. And with that, I'm gonna fire some questions if there's any. And if there's any questions in the room, I can take those as well. Sorry. So the question was, what do you mean by bi-weekly? And that's a good question. It was every other week. So every two weeks. Yes. So the question was, how did we get the flow? So uh, depending on the level of sampling, um, we would do constant flow measurement uh, for most of our sites, but then some of our sites we did uh, every two weeks flow measurement as well, just like taking a bucket out there and a stopwatch. That would be our, was our lowest level of, of monitoring there. Yeah, Brad. Uh, 
So the question was, have we tried to calculate pounds per acre losses for nitrate through our tile systems? And yeah, all, all of our, our really um, automated systems, we do calculate losses on pounds per acre. And that's primarily what we uh, report on in terms of losses of pounds per acre. However, when we talk to farmers, the, that pounds per acre uh, number is so heavily impacted by the amount of precipitation or the amount of tile flow that you get that some of your things that you can control in terms of your agronomic practices are, are lost due to you had a lot of tile flow in one year and you didn't have much tile flow in another year. That's why we tend to stick to, to concentrations when we're looking at evaluating management practices um, in terms of their ability to reduce tile nitrates. Yes. So the question was on a lot of the slides we had rate of nitrogen and was that just commercial fertilizer or was that manure? And it was all sources. So including uh, a legume uh, uh, nitrogen credit if there was a, a legume in the rotation. All right. So first question online here. Let's see if I can work this. Are you working with systems with open inlets, closed combo? Most of our systems are uh, closed, don't have uh, open inlets. Um, however, we have worked with uh, sites with open, open inlets in the past um, and can see some differences primarily in terms of sediment and phosphorus movement with those uh, open inlets. Um, but this is, uh, I remember one of our sites we monitored for six or seven years had open inlets throughout the system. And based on our data set, we could tell that they were, the open inlets really only moved water one time during that six years of study. Uh, but when it did move water during that time period, it was moving higher uh, amounts of soil and phosphorus. Have you seen an increase in flow during the winter months due to trending warmer temperatures in the winter? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think we're gonna see, see some differences due to trending warmer temperatures in the winter. Might not be with tile flow. Um, it might have more to do with surface water runoff and snow melt and how freeze thaw cycles can either decrease that snowpack and lessen the amount of snow melt, uh, that snow melt runoff that we get, or maybe that freeze thaw cycle creates such a, a hard frost that we, we see more snow melt runoff. But I think in the tile flow, we typically just don't see in Minnesota anywhere, anyway, much flow during the winter months. And I don't uh, think the trending warmer temperatures will affect that much because um, we typically don't see much precipitation during the winter months anyway. What time of the year do you see highest nitrate concentrations? How about loads? Uh, so I, I didn't put in the, the data we have in terms of when we see most of our tile runoff, but we see most of our tile runoff from April through July. So this is typically when we see our highest nitrate loads as well, because we see such a high correlation between flow and nitrate load. Highest nitrate concentrations. Um, I, I've been surprised at how um, consistent they've been throughout the year, uh, but if they do typically peak in the springtime and then decrease throughout the summer. Why did corn alfa after alfalfa need 100 pounds of N? Oh, I erased it. Uh, it's because I don't like that question. No, I, I don't know exactly what happened on that site. It's just a, a snapshot of what happened. Um, so I'm guessing there was some sort of manure application included in that site, which is uh, fairly typical at, at some of our dairy farms. So any other questions? Yes, Bruce. Yeah, Luke, just a guess. A lot of times when 
did see a big spike that might be due to mild after the alfalfa was terminated. You apparently didn't see that. Uh, any thoughts on why? <laughs> so Bruce asked, uh, literature suggests that you typically see a higher uh, nitrate concentration after you terminate the alfalfa and move into corn. Um, and we, we haven't seen that in our discovery farm sites. Um, it typically is, has been delayed about a year um, where that first year, I don't know if there's some lasting, um, lasting effect that, that works through that first year. Uh, we typically see after that first year, we see that the higher concentrations. Um, so I, I don't have the answers as to why that is. Thank you.